Hello, welcome to the one of the McDonald Observatory live streams. So my name is Saul Rivera. I'm, you probably know me by now. I've been some of the streams. So public program specialist that works here, work at the visitor center. And with me today is Dr. Stephen Janowicki. Thanks, Saul. Yeah, and uh, welcome tonight to the HET control room. We are here at the Hobby Everly Telescope uh, control room. Uh, it's not a place where a lot of people get to come after sunset, <laughs> so you're you're lucky to be joining us in here. Um, uh, the Hobby Everly Telescope is one of the biggest in the world, and it's the biggest in North America with a 10-meter mirror uh, collecting light tonight uh, and every night. Um, and we're here to show you a little bit about what happens uh, during a normal night. Uh, so normally we don't have people watching, but it just makes it more fun uh, to share. So um, yeah, my name is Stephen Janowicki. I'm um, one of the resident astronomers here uh, and the science operations manager. So I'm responsible for the team of folks who works here every night. Um, making sure that the telescope is running and we're observing everything in the sky that we need to observe. Um, we're a little bit unique um, among other telescopes uh, that the astronomers who want to use this telescope don't visit us in person to use it. Uh, they send us all their information about what kind of observations they need and we here, the local experts uh, as it were, uh, run the telescope every night, take their observations and then send them the data um, the next day. Uh, so they'll get an email tomorrow morning that says you've got data. They can download their new observations and learn something about the universe with their morning coffee. Um, and we'll be asleep. Uh, so um, yeah, every night there's one of us uh, resident astronomers here, like me. Um, and then every night we also have a telescope operator here. Um, Nathan is sitting behind us here. He's got more screens. That's how you can tell he's a telescope operator. Um, we don't have as many screens on the astronomer desk here. but. Um, can you introduce yourself and say hi. Yeah. So, my name is Nathan. I'm a telescope operator here at the uh, Everly Telescope. Um, I get, get a bit closer. So my name is Nathan. I'm the uh, telescope operator for tonight. Uh, so my job usually uh, entails uh, move, uh, setting up the, the telescope on each of the targets that the rest of the astronomer hands over to us. Um, I'm also uh, generally involved with uh, safety of the telescopes and making sure that uh, we don't get rained on, making sure that there's no condensation. Um, if anything breaks down, I'm usually uh, first in line to uh, see if I can fix it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's generally my responsibilities here. Mm -hmm. so we'll be here all night long and observing everything that we can. So um, I think I wanted to share a little bit about the telescope. If I can do those slides. Yeah. Share that. So um, we're going to show you everything, you know, from from all the raw details and the and the gory details. Um, but I wanted to just introduce you a little bit to the telescope first, um, in case you haven't visited us before. Um, this is sort of a drawing of what the telescope looks like from outside. Um, there's there's a bunch of 91 separate hexagonal mirrors that combine to make one big mirror, um, and that collects light from the sky and focuses the light up onto the top of the telescope, uh, where we collect that light uh, and use it to, to send to different spectrographs. Um, it's an unusual telescope in that it observes at a fixed elevation above the horizon. So most telescopes, virtually all telescopes, can point <laughs> sort of up, down, and left, right. The Hobby Eberly Telescope is unique in that it's at a fixed elevation. That that was a more um, uh, cost-effective way to build it, uh, and it's led to a really amazing, powerful instrument. Um, so it just spins, spins around on the sky. So we, the astronomers, have to be very careful in planning our observations uh, so that we get targets that are at the right position in the sky so that we can observe them. Uh, but we're really good at that. Um, so it's a very it's a very efficient telescope. Once the light collects at the top, we use uh, fiber optic cables, um, like you would in telecommunications, to channel that light down to different spectrographs. So this telescope, the Hobby Eberly Telescope, is all spectrographs. We don't take pictures of the sky. Um, we, we take spectra. We break that light up into all the colors um, and see what it's made of and, and how it's moving. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, a spectrum is worth a thousand pictures. So it's a really powerful way to study um, the universe. So I just wanted to briefly introduce you to our spectrographs. Um, the first one lives out in the dome next to the telescope. It sits on these boxes right up next to the mirror. Um, and it's the Visible Integral Field Replicable Unit Spectrograph uh, virus, because it has a bunch of copies of itself. Um, it was designed to study dark energy uh, about 
two thirds of the way across the universe, the visible universe from us. Uh, and it does that with about 35,000 fiber optic cables that simultaneously observe different spots on the sky. Um, we aren't going to use that instrument much or at all tonight because uh, it's very sensitive to blue light um, and tonight the moon is out and the moon is very bright and it really um, just washes this instrument out so we use this instrument on dark nights when the moon is not out um, our second instrument is the second generation low resolution spectrograph um, which is uh, sort of a very multi-purpose spectrograph that can do kind of everything it has really excellent coverage with red and blue lights coming in. Um, and it sits in one of these boxes out in the dome as well. Same kind of idea as virus. Uh, and then our uh, third instrument is actually downstairs in the basement. A fiber optic cable runs all the way down there. And that's our uh, habitable zone planet finder. Uh, so it works in the red and near infrared light, slightly past what we can see with our eyes. And it's extremely high resolution. It's, it's one of the most precise and stable spectrographs on any telescope on Earth or in space. Um, and it, it has an exquisite uh, calibration system that lets us measure the tiny wobble of a small planet orbiting around a star. That little tiny Doppler shift that the star makes, we can measure it with this spectrograph. So um, I can, just as a preview right now, um, we're observing, we're working, you know, the sun is down, <laughs> uh, the telescope is open, we're using the low resolution spectrograph right now. Um, so as, as those exposures finish, I'll show you what we're doing with that um, and how, how the data look and, and what, we, what we get with those. Um, just a quick last little introduction to how the telescope works. Uh, we, we always have, oh, there you go, you heard a telescope sound. Uh, <laughs> yeah, also a beep and such is a telescope working. Yeah. So actually, it's time for me to move the telescope to the new target. So uh, let me just tell Nathan. Nathan, this is another LRS-2R with an ACAM blind set up. Okay. Yeah, so while they're getting telescope position, something I forgot to mention in the beginning, if throughout the program tonight, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. We do have moderators keeping an eye on the chat just to make sure, just to answer any questions that come in, and they'll be passed along to us, and we can talk about them as well. And what's the noise there you might be hearing right now? Oh, yeah, did you hear that? So the, um, the loud hissing sound, let me unshare, or let me go back actually. The loud hissing sound is our, um, is our telescope moving. So uh, underneath the bottom feet of the telescope, there's inflatable sort of uh, air bearings, like little hovercrafts. And the telescope right now is floating on a cushion of air, spinning around until you hear that sound, that little squeak. That was the sound of them stopping. And we get some nice whale sounds as they sort of settle <laughs> down. Uh, and now that motor spinning is the sound of the tracker moving across the top of the telescope. So this um, large system up here is sliding back and forth to get to the right position um, to intercept the target that we're planning on observing here. So I'll show you some more pictures of that as we go, but let me um, yeah. get this one in here. Yeah, so right now Cal, we're kind of getting everything nice and positioned. So some other little things is kind of exactly where in the telescope we are. So usually people ask if you're like right next to the telescope, whether you're like somewhere nearby. So we are actually inside a control room of the telescope. So here's kind of the Hobby Ridley telescope out late at night. And we're in a little area right, right in there, a little building connected to it. And actually we're gonna pull up a live feed, uh, like live camera view of it. Yeah. So that camera is outside on a building adjacent to us, pointed back at the dome. Um, and that's that's live. It's kind of grainy, but that's what science looks like. Um, <laughs> oops. And actually, OK, great timing. So this is our um, low resolution uh, spectrum that just came in. Uh, so if you see, it's kind of a lot to look at at first. Uh, don't be overwhelmed. But um, let me just zoom in on one section here. So um, this instrument works um, by having a bunch of little fibers on the sky, fiber optic cables. And each fiber gets sent down to the spectrograph, and we get a full rainbow spectrum out of each fiber. And that's what you're seeing. These stripes going left to right are the spectrum of each fiber. Uh, and the little dots are, are emission lines from the night sky. But you can see there's some really strong uh, white lines here. That's our star that we were observing. So the star, in this case, has pretty broad colors. It's a, It's got light coming at all wavelengths, so it's well, it kind of fades off there at the red end, um, but it looks like a pretty ordinary star. 
um, I can tell you more about what we were actually doing that observation for later on. But um, that's that's it. That's a raw raw spectrum, fresh from the biggest telescope in North America. So not a lot of people get to see uh, that level of detail. But um, anyway, this is the telescope you can see right now. We're actually pointed away from this camera view. So later on, we think um, we may be pointed in different directions. Uh, in this view, you can also see our alignment tower. Um, most telescopes don't have one of these, uh, but we use that tower at the beginning of the night uh, to shine a light down onto the mirror and make sure that all 91 mirror segments are focused and aligned to exactly the same position. That's one of the other things that our telescope operators uh, take care of and maintain all night long. So, um, yes, let me, I think what we want to do next is talk about Q observing. Is that yeah, right? yeah, like how the astronomers, well, a question people usually ask is how do astronomers even get to use a telescope? And then for someone like this, how do you even decide which, like arrange them, decide what to do, what times? Yeah, that's right. And I think I have a slide to answer that question. So it's, um, first off, it's quite competitive. Um, it is not uh, easy to get access to a telescope like this. Um, so uh, the Hobby Everly Telescope is is owned by a, a group of partner institutions, uh, and those those institutions uh, pay for the telescope to be operated, uh, and so they get access to the telescope. Um, so if you're an astronomer at the University of Texas, Penn State, uh, or our two German university partners, you're you're allowed to request time um, on the telescope. Uh, if your proposal gets approved by your your partner institution, then your data your observation requests get sent to us. Um, this is a pretty competitive process. There's only so much time available at night, and there's always uh, sort of more people wanting to do observations than we can ever possibly do. Um, so uh, the partners decide which observations get approved, uh, and then we, we do our best to observe everything we can. I think, oh yeah, I sort of talked about that. Um, so we're the ones here at night trying to, trying to do the best observations. Um, and I want to show you what that looks like. This is also a very behind the scenes look. I am um, giving kind of a smaller view of this than normal because some of the um, astronomers observing here have sort of, um, you know, new discoveries that they're about to make. And so I can't show you everything, uh, but I can at least show you the basics of what we look at at night. So this is our observing queue. Uh, Q is just a fancy word for like a list or a line. Um, so this is what it looks like every night. We see there are tons of targets. These are all different different types of targets. I've hidden their names just in case you know there was a brand new supernova and you went out and tried to scoop us. <laughs> um, but there there are lots of different targets. Everything: galaxies, stars, planets, um, supernovas. Um, See, like this one is currently undergoing an outburst. That's very exciting. Ooh. So um, what we do at night is we try to figure out what's the best target to observe at every at every time. So um, as a real example, if you can see that countdown clock up there, uh, that tells me I've got four minutes left on this current exposure. And it's currently 1.43 UT. We use universal time here, because then you don't have to change for daylight saving time. Um, so that means I need to pick a target that starts Kind of being available right around 147. So we've calculated in this column here uh, the optimal start time. You know the best, the best time to observe this target so that it's right at 55 degrees above the telescope. Uh, and so that's one of the most important things we think about. Um, the other important thing is is what they call the priority. So when the partners allocate their science time, they decide what's most important and what's less important. Um, and so our priority system is zero is the highest because we're astronomers, we start counting from zero, um, and then four is the lowest. So you can see right now we've got a whole slew of priority three targets that go for a while and some priority ones coming later. But right now around 146, 147, we've got a lot of these priority three targets. So um, I usually just try to pick the one that's closest. So this one's at 147. Uh, that's when we're going to be observing it. Um, and so I will go ahead and get ready. We always kind of work a couple steps ahead. So I'm um, on a different screen. We have a lot of screens here. I'm setting up the telescope to be ready to move to that target um, in about two minutes. So the other kinds of conditions that we pay attention to at night, um, the 
astronomers requesting time can request uh, what what kinds of conditions they're observed under. So um, the sky column, uh, an S, means that it has to be at least 50% transparency in the sky. So we can't be like covered in clouds. So I think I can bring this down to show you. That's a, an all sky camera located here on site looking up at the sky. Um, this cool overlay is the part of the sky that the HET can see. That's our uh, annulus of visibility. We can look at anything in that 55 degree window up there. Uh, and it looks pretty clear right now. Maybe some clouds down on the horizon, but overhead I would say we have easily better than 50% transparency. So no problem observing those targets. Um, and then the other really important one is what astronomers like to call seeing. Um, it doesn't really match what common language uses seeing to mean, but um, what we mean by seeing is uh, how turbulent is the atmosphere? How blurry are the images of the stars? Um, and we measure that in a unit called an arc second, which there are uh, 3,600 arc seconds in one degree, and the moon is about a half a degree. So it's a very, very small unit. Um, under really good, clear, stable, calm conditions, we can sometimes get one arc second seeing, 1.2 arc seconds. Um, and this target is requesting 2.75 as their you know, maximum tolerance of image quality. If the stars start to get really blurry, uh, your observations, your quality gets a lot worse because the same amount of light gets spread out over a bigger area. So you get a lower quality measurement of that. So um, we track that image quality during the night with a graph like this, which is probably a little unfriendly for the uninitiated, <laughs> but I'm going to show you all the details anyway. So um, this is tracking in real time. Um, this is right now. It's 146, 147 universal time, Greenwich mean time. Um, and this is telling us what the current measurements of the image quality of the, the turbulence is. We get a lot of different information that we pull together at this telescope. So, um, But what I want to focus most on are these green and kind of yellowish points at the top. Um, those are the um, image quality measurements, the size measurements from our guide stars. So um, in addition to having a focal plane of the or a focal surface of the telescope where the light collects to go to the spectrographs, we also have a couple of guide cameras around the edges. Uh, and those are constantly taking fast pictures every six minutes, six seconds uh, of a star. And we make sure that that star stays in the same place on the camera. We can't move the star, so we move the telescope to match that position. And if we track that star in the same place, the telescope stays on target. That's the primary purpose of guide stars, um, but they also tell us uh, how, how good the sky quality is. So um, let me stop talking for just a second because the telescope counter just got finished. And that's the sound that means the exposure is done. Exposure finished. It talks to <laughs> us. So I'm going to send the commands to move to the new target. Okay, Nathan, this is a LRS 2R A cam blind. Okay. Yeah. What kind of how like uh, so on Stephen Janowicki's like Stephen Janowicki screen like part of that the part that actually he's typing into is lots of commands and coding. Lots of coding goes into this. So what coding language do it use usually? Yeah. Well, the um, there's a lot of different languages depending on um, the purpose. So the deep the, like the infrastructure stuff makes the telescope run is in like C++ and oh. pretty serious code languages. Um, but the, the developers who wrote all that also gave us a Python interface to the okay. telescope. So Python is a language that you can learn in a day or two. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a very user-friendly language to get started. Um, and so actually, the scripts that I'm running are, are generated by Python code that some of our other astronomers and operators have written. So oh, cool. um, we, we do a lot of our own um, development on, on making the telescope work. And because it's Python, you know, it's pretty easy to just like start making a script or a program that runs a telescope. So um, it's a little scary, actually, <laughs> how easy it is to, to command the telescope. Uh, but it's, uh, um, yeah. So there's, but there's, there's a couple of other, the, the graph that I showed, actually, the image quality graph is a Python software. Oh. Um, it, it connects into the telescope, and it listens, and it plots. And um, yeah, it's a very um, simple, simple, uh, effective tool. So I want to actually show you the observation that we just finished. Okay. 
Oh, they're getting some real live data, some more real life data. Uh -huh. So it looks pretty similar to the last one. Um, this is another star. Uh, it's a star. I, I know about this because I know what <laughs> program um, this is observing for, but this is a star that, that hosts exoplanets. Um, but we're not using our high precision spectrograph on it. This is sort of our low precision, broad coverage one. So what the um, what the astronomer will use this data for is to look at some of these real faint kind of spots where there's like a missing line or a missing color. Let me adjust that. You can see that the spectrum has some gaps in it. You know, there's some dark bands where there's not much light. Um, that's from different chemicals in the atmosphere of that star. So uh, the astronomer knows the star has a planet, uh, but what they want to learn is what's the star made of? What's the chemical composition of the star itself? So this is a project that they're working on to characterize the, the chemistry of a whole bunch of stars with exoplanets. So um, mm -hmm. it's a great follow-up project on that. The, after this target, the next one, I think, will be a, a very different kind of target. So we can um, look at some other data Ooh. as well. And I wanted to show you, it's, it's, not, um, it's not really uh, normal, or it's not typical, but um, whenever we're observing with any spectrograph on this telescope, or with the low resolution or the high resolution, we always take virus spectrograph exposures in the background. So we just get that data for free. So you know, right now, we're pointed at an exoplanet hosting star, so learning. Sweet. Thank you. Learning about exoplanet compositions. But all those virus spectrographs are running and ready to go, so we run them. We take exposures all night long just on wherever they land, um, free data. Um, and this, I can show you, is what one raw virus exposure looks oh, like. Wow. So where the um, other spectrographs was just kind of one little patch of the sky, virus covers an area that's almost as big as the full moon. It's a huge patch of the sky. Um, and if I zoom out, you can see just how many separate um, spectrographs. Let me just show you one. So each each spectrograph, you know, has a bunch of fibers, and each fiber is a single spectrum. But as you zoom out, okay, that's one, and then we have about thirty thousand separate fibers on the sky, all observing simultaneously. <laughs> so. You know, that wasn't our science project right now. That's just free data that we get. And there's a bunch of astronomers who are using that to study sort of unexpected things, finding finding new things that we weren't even looking for. Yeah. You can see a bunch of stars. That's what these kind of bright, streaky things are. That's a nice bright star in there. Yeah. But, um, and actually, someone asked uh, quantum radio. Uh, these are spectro, spectro, like, ah, getting tongue tied. <laughs> Spectrometer images with the black gap indicating an absorption line, right? Yes, exactly. So these, um, that's what the vertical gaps. Let me zoom in on one. That's a great question. So these vertical lines here, um, I should have told you the wavelength direction is left to right. So this is the blue side, and this is the red side. Um, this, the horizontal black gaps are missing fibers. That's a place where one of the fibers isn't connected or isn't needed, and so that's that's a missing fiber. Um, but the vertical gaps, yep, yeah, that's a that's an absorption line. There's some chemical somewhere between our spectrograph and that's that source that's absorbing that color of light, so we don't see that color. Yeah, that's a great question. Cool. Let me get um, back to the queue because it's almost time. Yeah, we've got three minutes on this target. Yeah, and actually, while we're getting back, a question came in mm -hmm. from C from Bob Snyder, do you guide and deck and RA? Ah, yes, good question, we do. Um, I can show you that actually on um, on our next target. We we guide and deck and RA and so much more um, because this telescope, again, is, is really like a two of a kind. There's a copy in South Africa, but it's a very unique telescope. Um, we, um, well, can I hold that for a second? Yeah. Let's look at the queue because we've only got about two minutes to choose our next target. Yeah, it's like we're literally on the clock. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fast-paced observing world here. So I think so. two minutes from now will put us about 157. And there are some targets that are priority three around 157, but I think we're going to go for this priority one target that's coming up. It's you know, 205, so we'll be going to it about seven minutes early. Um, but usually within about five to 10 minutes of, of the optimal time gives us a very, very good um, spectrum. So I think we're going to go there just a tiny bit early. So okay. I'm going to get the telescope ready to do that one. 
next. All right. And yes, you kind of see there's a whole long list of these. So these frogs try to go through it through as many as they can in one night. As Dr. Steve Jam, what he says, it gets sent to Austin, then to the astronomers, and they receive the email that has arrived. And whatever we don't observe tonight, we'll try to come back and get again tomorrow night. So <laughs> we uh, we never stop, um, which is kind of an advantage because in a in a classical or a more traditional telescope setup, if you apply for time, you might get assigned March thirteenth. That's your night. If it snows that night, sorry, come back next year. Um, whereas here at the at the Q observing system that we have at the Hobby Eberly Telescope, um, if you get your time awarded to you, there's a pretty good chance we're actually going to observe it uh, at some point during the during that that season. Yeah. So um, I want to share though when we go to this target, I'm going to show them um, a little bit more of the telescope. Okay. Um, so I think I want to share. Ooh, that's not good. I want to share <laughs> this screen again. Um, so this, this is a sort of a simulated view um, that imagines um, what the mirror looks like. So you can see all the little hexagons. Um, and this shows you where the tracker is moving above the mirror. This will actually get back to the question about guiding um, in just a second. So um, in about a minute, when we go to this next target, you're going to see the, the telescope, um, the tracker actually move to a different position above the mirror. Um, so I can tilt this around a little bit and you can see so the Ooh. yellow line shows us exactly where we are right now and these other little paths are where we were for targets early, earlier in the night uh, so that's how we're set up above the telescope right now and in just a few seconds we're going to move to the next target here and i'll try this time to narrate more of what you're hearing on these sounds as well because it's uh, it's a very expressive telescope. We, um, the telescope operators are really good at listening to the sounds and you know, very fine-tuned hearing. If they hear something weird, you know, they have a big red button they can push to <laughs> shut it all down. So, um, okay. Exposure finished. All right, Nathan, this is a LRS-2B with an ACAN blind sign. So I tell Nathan what we're doing, and then you hear that was the brakes, the tracker brakes um, engage. And you're going to hear the structure lift up with a sound. There you go. Those are the air bearings lifting. And at this point, you should also hear a kind of thunk, which is the sound of the dome breaks and starting to move. So, there, that thunk. That was the brakes releasing, and now the dome is free to rotate. Oh, and you're getting data. Okay, I'll push that off to the side right now. <laughs> and we might even be able to see the dome turn. It's not going to be a huge move, but you can look at both of these together. There we go. So the tracker is moving here. Um, that's bringing it to intercept with this next target. And you can oh. just see the dome starting to spin there. It moves slowly from this view. Um, you can hear those are the tracker motors spinning up there and coming down. And that's the sound of the structure stopping the airflow, and it starts to settle down. Yeah, the dome's going to come around nicely. It's nice we have a little moonlight to light up the dome for us tonight. All right, the tracker brakes are set, so it's starting to engage on this track so that it can follow our object in the sky. And the dome got there. Those are the dome brakes engaging. Uh, and so at this point, okay, and the last of the air is getting sucked out of those air pressure bearings. At this point, you're really getting the full shot here. This is our like um, operational GUI, the, the graphic interface that we use to control the telescope. Um, so this is a view of our acquisition camera. So I told you we don't take any images. The only images we really take are when we're setting up on a target. So um, instead of using all the fiber optic cables that are in our focal surface, we pop out this little mirror and catch the light that the telescope is sending up and send it to a small camera, um, which is showing us the image here from that camera. Uh, that lets us point the telescope in exactly the right position uh, for this target, which is what Nathan is working hard at while we talk over here. Um, so he's moving the telescope, doing really fine adjustments, and getting it set up um, exactly on the right star. Uh, we've, we have a, a way of measuring 
uh, the pixels, the exact positions on this camera, and how those correspond to the focal surface of the telescope. So we know if we put a star right at pixel number, you know, 499 by 132, it's going to land right on the the fiber we want it to land on. So it's a it's a pretty nice way to set up on on faint targets, especially. So. So Nathan does that with the acquisition camera, and then after he's happy with where the, the acquisition camera is set up, he's going to use one of our guide cameras. So here's a view of, of one, one of the guide cameras. We have two for redundancy. Um, and he's going to say, OK, guide star, you see that spot? That's where I want you to stay. You know, don't move. Um, and if the guide star stays there, then the telescope stays lined up on target. So the guider, uh, what the guider is doing is the RA and deck corrections to, to answer that, that earlier okay. question. The guider is is compensating for that sort of up, down, left, right motion. Um, and that's information is being fixed. Um, that information is being sent to the tracker in real time so that it can make small corrections to the path that it's taking to intercept that light. But that's only two out of the six dimensions that the tracker has to move in. Um, so it's it's really important to track left, right, up, down. Um, but we also have to keep the telescope in focus. So the tracker has to move closer to the mirror or farther away from the mirror. Um, and the tracker also has to stay at the right orientation. So if it were to get sort of tilted relative to the mirror, we would get pretty bad distortions. So it has to do the um, sort of the up, down, and the left, right tilt. Um, and then as we track objects through the sky over a, over our telescope, they appear to rotate slightly. So the tracker also derotates to correct for that, that rotation of the sky. Um, and we have a very fancy um, system for compensating for that. And this gets into like uh, optics and physics that we don't have time to, to talk about. <laughs> but um, instead of just using a guide star to compensate for the sort of up, down, left, right motions, we use this. Um, Shaq Hartman lenslet array that splits up the light from the telescope into all the different mirrors, basically. We can separate the reflections that come from each part of the mirror, and we use those. That's what you're seeing here, separate reflections of the same guide star from different positions around the telescope. We use that to figure out the focus, the tip, the tilt, the rotation, everything. Um, so uh, we do guide in RA and DEC, but we also guide in rho, theta, phi, and focus. Oh, wow. So it's, uh, it's an amazing machine. Um, and it sort of feels like a miracle every night when it just, <laughs> just works. Because as an astronomer, all I have to do is say, you know, that's the target I want to observe. Um, and with Nathan's help operating, we observe it. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing um, that it works. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. So we actually had some questions come in. Sure. So from Steven Yanagisawa, how often are the mirrors aligned, or is it done continuously? Right. Are all the mirrors used at once? Yeah, good question. So we do kind of a big alignment at the beginning of the night with that um, tower, the alignment tower that's next to the telescope. And that's kind of big. That's like making significant moves to the segments to make them all lined up. But then in real time throughout the night, we have really high precision sensors between each segment, so at the edges of, of, of some of the segments. And those sensors measure exactly where they are relative to each other. And that information is constantly used to make fine tuning adjustments. So the big alignment is done at the beginning of the night and hopefully just once if the temperatures are pretty stable throughout the night. Um, but then the mirror is constantly making these really fine adjustments. Because you heard, we, we lift the whole thing up and set it down again. And so there's a lot of motion out there. So the mirrors, they don't just stay put. We actually control them actively. You know, oh, OK. So it's a right alignment. So. Yeah, and actually a cow question that goes along with it from Quantum Radio. Yeah. The mechanism of cow side of whales a better to like the tracker and such. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing with some of the telescope as well, it's the electric motor and not pneumatic ones or Oh uh, yeah, we use both. We have um, we have some electric motors and we have some pneumatics. Um, there's uh, there's a really big air compressor out back that runs a lot of the pneumatic systems. <laughs> um, like a lot of our um, Optomechanical parts like the shutters and the, the little calibration sources are all pneumatically controlled. Um, mm -hmm. The mirror that pops out to look at the acquisition camera is pneumatic. Um, the structure obviously lifts up on pneumatic bearings. Um, but then, like the big motors that actually drive the tracker around are, are electric, um, okay. and that creates that creates a lot of heat in the dome, which can be a problem. Um, for heat dissipation. We don't want hot air above the telescope. Uh, so we actually have like little mini refrigerators around every motor. Uh, and we can we can send the heat out. We have a heat exchanger way down 
that way <laughs> yeah. uh, so that the heat doesn't come into the telescope. So yeah, the, we do have some pretty big electric motors. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, it knows the timer went down too. Yeah, um, but we're taking this target. I should have shown that earlier. This target is requesting two exposures. Um, so that's one of the other things that a strong oh three actually oh. so uh, they want three two hundred second exposures so that's the first one just finishing and we can look at that in just a second oh yeah right now okay so yeah. we can play a fun game called yeah. does anybody know what this is <laughs> <laughs> it's not impossible uh, let's <laughs> see. Okay, because left is is so it's going from blue to red, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And these lines that are like in every single one, those are just emission lines from the night sky. That's oh. Just a, a local oxygen. So the interesting stuff are these blips that kind of come and go. Uh, and uh, yeah, okay. Um, this is a planetary nebula. Oh. So you may not have known that just by looking, but... Um, would, it, would it be helium? Um, helium and hydrogen, yep. So this, okay. this is the hydrogen line here. The helium is off the edge over there. Um, but this is the, the hydrogen alpha emission, the Balmer hydrogen line, um, which is... Uh, so it, planetary nebula, right, is the exploded shell of a, of a star like our sun. Uh, but the important thing is that the gas is really hot. It's ionized by that central star. Uh, and when it gets hot, it's kind of like gas in a fluorescent light tube or a neon light tube. It glows. It fluoresces. Mm. Uh, and it does that at just one specific wavelength. So this is the wavelength of hydrogen. Um, it's around 6,500 angstroms or 650 nanometers. Um, these are sulfur. Uh, there's a, probably a nitrogen line close up in there. And if I switch over to one of the other sections, we might even see... Oh, no. Okay. No, it's mostly just hydrogen. So every planetary nebula is different. I'm not exactly sure what, what planetary nebula this is, but I can tell you um, that's planetary nebula. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, planetary nebulas are wild. I think they're some of the crazy, craziest things to look at because they're, like, remember we looked at that star and there was kind of a nice, smooth light, you know, yeah. all colors? No. Planetary nebulas are all emission lines. It's H alpha, or hydrogen alpha, or it's just oxygen, and nothing else. It's a, <laughs> like a really wacky spectrum. Um, I like to see those. But, yeah. Uh, oh, so a question came in. I know you did have something kind of to go along with this. So actually, there were two questions that kind of came in. So one was from a Walking a Fever. How are the pleasant stars labeled and tagged to be able to find? And from Saliu S. K. Hulkarn, apologies I'm mispronouncing it, why not automate the observation list? Keep jumping from target to car target automatically based on predetermined sequence. Yeah, that well that second one is a is a is a good question. We can come back to the first one though as well. But um, about automating, we we have tried various degrees of that over the years and have never found a system as good as a human yet. Um, there are a lot of factors um, to think about when you're choosing the next target. And um, you could make a great plan in the afternoon um, based on the weather forecast for that night. Um, but if you've ever seen a weather forecast before, <laughs> uh, you know it might not happen anything close to how it was supposed to happen. Um, so we are sort of very dynamic here. We're very ready to adjust to changing conditions. Um, but we're also very receptive to new requests that might come in during the night. Um, it's not common, but at least occasionally we get either a phone call or an email that says, hey, the supernova just went off. You know, I have a observing time. Can I use it right now? And we say, sure, send us your target and we'll do it. Um, so that's one of the huge advantages of a telescope like this, uh, where you don't get assigned a night, you get assigned 10 hours and you can use your hours kind of whenever makes sense. So um, there is one of our uh, most active research groups uh, watches for supernovas and they, you know, get a text message from a uh, telescope in California that says, hey, we just discovered oh. a new supernova. And they say, oh, yeah, we need to get a spectrum. <laughs> um, a lot of supernova are discovered with images, right? So you say, oh, there's a new dot. And that's all you can say. <laughs> when you get a spectrum, then you can say, oh, look, it has these chemicals in it. It has this kind of a velocity signature. Like, we learn a lot more um, about the science when we get the spectrum. So, um, so yeah, we could make kind of a rough list. And we do, we'd make like a sketch, maybe let's call it, in the afternoon of like, here's some of the most important targets that you should get tonight. 
don't forget about that supernova. We, you know, we have like a little reminder to ourselves. But then filling in the details, um, it's it's very dynamic. Um, and because our telescope can observe only a very small range of the sky, if your schedule gets off by more than 10 or 15 minutes, those aren't the best targets anymore, and you need to pick better ones. So um, we, yeah, we are we are a very dynamic one, and I think. Speaking of which, we have three minutes now um, to pick our next target. So that would put us at about 2.13. So I think 2.13, I'd probably like to catch this one. I think, although let me check what our image quality, because they require 1.8 arc second seeing, which is a little better. So let's see what we're getting. Ooh. We're getting 1.5 right now, so that's yeah, that's acceptable. 1.8 would be kind of up there. So okay, yeah. So I'm gonna get the telescope set up to go to this one next, and that's exciting because we haven't used this instrument yet tonight. This is with the Habitable Zone Planet Finder, so I can um, share that spectrum. Yeah, next. you get a new yeah. uh, type of data. Oh, yes, yes. Um, it's also a long exposure. It's about 30 minutes, so we'll oh, have wow. some more time to talk while we're on that one. The typical exposure that we do here is probably 30 minutes, 20 or 30 yeah. minutes. So these short targets, sometimes at the beginning of the night or when the moon is out, we'll do a lot of short targets, but um, usually more like 20 or 30 minutes is typical. So okay. I'll get this one set up here. All right. What was that first question? Oh, the first question was uh, from Walking in Favor, how are the requested stars labeled and tagged to be able to find? Oh, yeah. Good question. We um, we have no end of catalogs in astronomy. <laughs> there are um, just dozens and dozens. We have a lot of them are actually loaded into our system already if we need to use those. Um, but most of the targets that we observe are submitted by one of the astronomers who wants us to observe them. And for that purpose, we don't really care what they call them. Um, what we need are the coordinates. We need to know exactly where to point the telescope. Um, so we have for the sky a system of longitude and latitude very similar to what you're probably familiar with on the Earth. If you give us two numbers, we can point the telescope um, to that position. Um, so we have um, we have some software actually that runs in the afternoon to check all those positions and it makes us like a little finder chart to say, okay, when you go there, here's what you should see, which is great so that we're not wasting time at night, like, wait a second, is that the right star? <laughs> like, so it's all it's all pre-computed, and uh, we know we know where we're going. But um, as for names, I think there are there are hundreds of catalogs. Uh, so any given bright star probably has a dozen names or more. Um, yeah, and also depends are they visible with the eye when they were discovered? Did people already yes. give it a nickname or not? That's and, right. Yeah, and a lot of the coordinate, a lot of the target names are just the coordinates, like J two three eight five six seven plus four two two. It's <laughs> like okay, fine, but. Um, yeah, so it varies, but for us, we just use the coordinates, whatever they tell us. Point the telescope right there, that's what we do to get the observations. Oh, cool. Yeah, so this one is just about done. Let me show you the dome. I think we're going to point the telescope over to the east for this target, so you should see a nice big dome move here. Exposure finished. All right. Nathan, this one is a HPF target uh, with a direct day cam setup. So that's the tracker brake stopping. And you'll hear the structure lift here. Okay. And we might we try switching this TV camera. Let's switch to the inside. Yeah. It's pretty dark out there. <laughs> uh, well, okay. I'll stay on the outside for right now, but. As we point around to the east, we're going to get some moonlight in the dome, and I'm hopeful that it might be enough for you to actually see the telescope. Ooh, that'd be cool. Uh, yeah, we'll see as it comes around. And then you can see the tracker moving. Yeah. Okay, and there was that last observation of that planetary nebula again. You can see the hydrogen alpha lines in there. Yeah. Oh, wow, it's spinning a lot. Yeah. 
to see that the tracker's in position. So everything's spinning around. Yeah, you can just start to see inside there. When the moonlight gets in there, we might be able to, oh, you can hear, we're starting to point more into the wind, so you can hear the wind on the microphone just a little bit better. <laughs> All right, so the structure is in position. Our dome is often the last one to arrive. So it's got about 30 degrees to go still as it rotates there. I'm going to switch to some of the internal views. Let's see if, you know, I think it's a little too dark in there. Yeah, no, it's still too dark. <laughs> well, a very dark sky, <laughs> even with the moon out. So, okay. Well, you can just see the top of the tracker right there. That's the that's where the light gets collected out of focus, right up there. And then the fiber optic cables take it down both sides. So, cool. I'm going to show you on this target. I think it's an especially fun one to watch what Nathan's doing. So we're going to watch over here. Um, so this is a relatively bright star, um, and it's going to show up. This is still the old field, but it's just about to show up on our acquisition camera as we get the telescope lined up on our new field. Oh, it's not that right. So I can show you, actually, what Nathan's looking at. He gets a finder chart. So oh. you make this ahead of time and say, that's what you should see. Um, and then we go there at night. And if you can see, there's kind of a bright star, two little stars, and a bright star. We've got a bright star, two little stars, and a bright star. Oh. So this one here is our science target. It's, it's labeled HPF Psi. So that's where we put it. If we put a star right there, it will land on the fiber optic cable that takes its light all the way down to the HPF spectrum. Oh, so okay. That's what Nathan's done. He's put it right there. Um, yeah. Interesting. To look at the telescope settled there, he's going to get his guide star going. He's going to get his wavefront sensor going. Do all the all the usual setup stuff, and then you're going to hear a sound um, that you haven't heard yet, um, which is um, kind of a cool story to explain that um, the. Habitable Zone Planet Finder is a really high precision spectrograph. It's, it's one of the highest precision in the world. It can detect, you know, Earth-like stars or Earth-like planets around M, M, M dwarfs, small stars. Um, and to get that kind of precision requires like crazy engineering. Like some of it's really expensive and, and really complex and really delicate, but other things are like really simple. Thanks. We'll be here thirty minutes. Really simple, but really effective. So um, what you're about to hear start is, is what we call the fiber scrambler, or the fiber agitator. So there's a fiber optic cable that runs all the way down to the spectrograph. And it turns out that if you shake that cable a little, uh, you can hear it. it's kind of faint. But it's this little screechy. There's a motor running and a little pulley and a little arm that just rocks that cable back and forth. And shaking the cable while the light goes through it improves the quality of the observation. It, it sounds crazy, I know, I know, but um, but just doing that minimizes some of the self-interference patterns inside the fiber optic cable. So um, whenever we're observing with the habitable zone planet finder, that fiber agitator is running and shaking the cable downstairs. So, <laughs> and it's like, a, you know, it's something you build in like a high school physics class. It has like one little DC motor, a pulley, and a little lever. Oh, <laughs> that's all this. Like, uh, and that makes a, a big difference on, on the quality of the observations. So, uh, we we have this crazy mix here of like ultra high technology and ultra low. Like the this habitable zone planet finder, the the detector, the actual thing that measures the light, was originally developed for the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, you know, this, this is the same detector as they're using up there. Um, it's actually a later generation because they flew the stuff, you know, a lot older than this. <laughs> but it's the same kind of near infrared detector. So that's like crazy new there's like 20 of them ever made right but then we've got like this dime store motor scrambling the cable next to it so you know whatever works to get the science done um, we have a, an amazing mix uh, of, of high tech and low tech um, to get the observations so, um, oh, and it popped up over here but 
um, while the um, HPF, while the infrared spectrograph is running, um, one other really crazy thing about it um, is that it doesn't, you don't have to wait till the end of an exposure to see the data. So uh, on this instrument, they, they call them non-destructive reads. So we can sort of just like check in with it, say like, hey, how much light have you collected? And it gives us sort of an image or a, you know, a, a, a data showing our spectrum. Um, and it just started collecting light. Um, and so it looks pretty faint. What you're seeing, these little pairs of lines are, are sky emission lines. So there's oxygen and water vapor and stuff in our Earth's atmosphere that are, that are shining. But if I wait just a couple minutes and I generate the image again, Maybe a little too soon, but I'll try. Let's see. Uh, yeah, okay, so here's oh. what we've got now. So it's been, you know, two minutes of exposure. We're going to be here for 30. But now <laughs> you can see this sort of stripe starting to come through, horizontal. So um, now, instead of having many, many fibers, this instrument has one fiber, but we split it into many separate spectra. Each one is a slightly different color. So if you combine them all together, you get a full rainbow. Um, so if we zoom in on here, that stripe that you're seeing across the middle there um, is the spectrum of a star. Uh, and oh, yeah, there's an example. You can see there's a, some absorption lines. There's just a teeny little black dot that's missing in there and some detector artifacts. But um, so yeah, this is the, oh yeah, there's some nice emission line, or absorption lines down there. But um, let me center that back up and I'll run it again. So that's after about two minutes. It's been maybe four minutes now. Let me get another check here. All right, and it's getting stronger. Oh. So you're starting to see even more light from that star. So we um, we can measure in real time sort of how much light have we collected. You know, how good a quality spectrum do we have? Um, and theoretically, we don't do it yet. But someday we could even say, oh, that's good enough. You can stop. You know, just instead of saying I want a 10-minute exposure you could say, I want to collect 10,000 photons or whatever. And we could just, they call that an exposure meter. Instead of saying, do it for this long, you say, do it until it gets that good. So if the sky is really clear, you might get it fast. If it's kind of cloudy, you just go longer. Oh. Um, so it's, a, it's an efficient way to, to adjust on the fly. But um, yeah, this, let me um, I want to just show one other thing with the HPF. Um, we have a tool here, in addition to making the, the little spectrum we get, or making an image, we can also actually look at the spectrum. And it's not a ton to see, but let me just zoom in down here. Yeah, maybe this is harder to see, but oh yeah, OK. Well, this won't mean very much, but uh, it's a very high precision spectrograph. So we cover a pretty broad wave, wavelength range of colors, so this is like the edge of human vision out to like, I don't know, tiger vision or something. Um, so we cover a lot of range. But as you can see, as we zoom in, you know, each each little detail. Okay, I'm not very good at this graph. Each little detail is very precise. Um, so we can measure like extremely little. You know, each one of those little blips up and down is probably a different element in the star. Some elements have multiple colors that they absorb light in. But with, with something like this, you can measure you know, calcium or lithium or uh, phosphorus or like you know, what, whatever. If you want to study the chemical composition of that star, you can do it. And then to do the planet finding work, they use those emission lines, but they don't care what they are. Because when the star has a planet going around it, that whole spectrum gets Doppler shifted back and forth just a little as that planet causes a tiny wobble. So they don't care that it's lithium and boron and silicon or whatever, but they can just measure those lines shifting back and forth ever so slightly. So, uh, and yeah, we, we can keep checking back in on this as it observes. Um, it'll get better and better. And I can leave this up. We can watch the tracker is just tracking across the mirror. And, um, this is, I would say, pretty typical of what we do. It's kind of a mix of short targets, some long targets. And uh, we're here all night, sunset to sunrise, 365 days a year, doing everything we can out of the observing queue. So um, cool. that's a, a good overview, anyway. Um, yeah. 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 So some questions that came in, kind of, mm -hmm. you were talking about like HPF and such. Well, it's for the agitator, is mm -hmm. it like, is this dithering for optical images? Uh, no, it's different. It's fundamentally different. Um, we, 
yeah, it's uh, it's just like pure magic. <laughs> like, uh, it's it's a it's an internal thing that really has to do with with taking spectra. So that I don't think there's an analogy for images because it's like the the wavelength of light traveling through the fiber optic cable can like interfere with themselves, like wave interference. Mm -hmm. um, like constructively and destructively. And if the fiber always sits in the same shape, that constructive and destructive interference can be really noticeable. And if you're moving it, it's not. So I, I guess maybe it's kind of like dithering, but it's really like different physics that's happening okay. than dithering. But it's the same idea that if you kind of move it around, you get a better overall picture. So yeah. in that way, yeah, there's there's some common technique, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, remember you said you had like a little activity people could do, like if they wanted to try. Oh yeah, do, we choosing could, their sure. own. Yeah, yeah. See, um, see if you can master the cube. Yeah, now have you learned about the telescope? See if you would be true. good enough to run the telescope. Excellent idea. Let me pull that up. And reset some things here. So this um, originated as a as a little game we played last summer with some um, special visitors. Uh, and it's a little bit more of a simulation, but it's based on real data. So while we're, while we're observing, tonight I would say the observing has been pretty easy. Uh, the sky is clear. The image quality is very good. And you saw in the, in the queue, there's kind of a lot of priority threes with an occasional priority one that you want to try to get if you can. So that's, that's pretty simple. But I put together um, some, a little game here um, that we can play. Uh, from a night actually back in, in July, uh, where I looked at what we were observing in the queue that night and what the sky conditions were like to try to show you what can happen uh, and, and how you can choose. So, okay, play this game with me. Pretend that it's 12.43 in the morning, 5.43 universal time, um, and we're getting one and a half arc second seeing. Image quality is pretty good. You know, sky is pretty stable. Uh, we're getting 90% transparency. So, great. Those are excellent conditions. So. Um, at that point, on that night, I was trying to choose between these three uh, targets. So the first one is a exoplanet hosting star with the habitable zone planet finder. That one has a priority of two, uh, requesting image quality of at least 2.5 arc seconds or better, uh, transparency of at least 50%, and it has a 30 minute exposure. Um, the second one is a, um, a high redshift galaxy uh, that is observed with a low resolution spectrum. It's a priority one, requesting 1.5 arc seconds, equal transparency, 60 minute exposure. Uh, and the third one is a Lyman alpha emitting galaxy on the other side of the universe. Um, but it's priority three, requesting a three arc second image quality. Um, and it's a pretty short 10 minute exposure. All right, so I'll give you a minute to think about because it's a lot of parameters to think about, but balance, you know, highest priority, best conditions, you know, what can we do? Here's what the sky looked like at that time. So uh, just think about it yourself, decide which one you want to do. And then what we're going to do here, I'll give you maybe just one more minute to think. A little wallet so, break. Yeah, <laughs> it's tricky. There's a lot of just one more. And then we'll fast forward through time and see what happened that night. OK, I hope you've discussed and got your target in mind. So we'll. Um, Fast forward through time. Yeah, or actually before they, um, you do, if you have a guess, feel free to put in the chat what you think and see how many agree with you or not. Right. Or and I'll, it, yeah, that's uh, right. Also some idea. records to see what you've been guessing. Right. You can take credit for uh, <laughs> getting it right. OK, so I'll assume that everybody's picked what they would do if they were the astronomer. So we're going to look at what happened that night. So you made your choice at 5.43. Now it's about 10 minutes later at 5.54. Um, and the image quality has gotten a little bit worse. Um, we are at 1.7 arc seconds. And unfortunately, the transparency has dropped to about 50% as this bank of clouds moves in from the southeast. So if you pick the second one, you're kind of out of spec for what needs to be done because the conditions have degraded. But it's only 10 minutes, so we'll keep going. Let's see what happens 10 minutes later. Uh, unfortunately, the transparency now is down to 20%. So that's worse than everybody wants. And the image quality is really blown up. The stars are kind of shaken all over the place, almost two arc seconds. So um, that's not good after 20 minutes. But we're going to go 10 more minutes here. 
and see, oh, okay, now we're just socked in. There's a thick band of clouds overhead, no stars to be seen through that area. Um, so at this point in the night, I would say we give up. We don't we don't observe <laughs> clouds. Um, we've done it before. They look the same. Um, so how did you do? Uh, which which target did you pick, and, and how did it go? Uh, overall, during that half hour, we had sort of 1.9 arc seconds image quality, about 20% transparency. So if you picked number one, uh, you know that that would have been the best choice based on the image quality, we got 1.9, um, but the clouds were too bad to be acceptable. I would have picked the second one because it was high priority, 21, um, but the, the sky got too crummy to observe it. Um, and this third one, uh, low priority, you know, pretty loose requirement. I'm sure no one picked it, and I wouldn't have picked it either, uh, but that one actually could have been observed. You can't predict the future. You wouldn't know there were clouds coming necessarily, but. Um, just to show you that the, the best choice is kind of not always the right choice. Um, it's it's frustrating when the clouds come in like that. So, okay, that was round one. I have two more. If oh, you yeah. want to think, uh, okay. Yeah, let's see. Now that we learned from round one, see if round two goes better. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit later in the night. That bank of clouds starts to move away um, and it starts to clear off again. And we've got 70% uh, transparency. So it's pretty good. It's not 100%, but not bad. Um, and we uh, see pretty good image quality 1.6. So these now these are the three targets that I was trying to choose from. Um, kind of a low priority 3 with 2.5 arc seconds, 10 minutes. Uh, priority 2, 1.5 arc seconds. That's a proto brown dwarf system that we're studying here. Uh, needs a long one hour exposure. Um, or a priority 1 with the habitable zone planet finder needs three arc seconds for 30 minutes. So give a minute again to think about what, what would you do? Yeah, again, yeah, feel free for them. And while you are deciding some questions that came in mm. uh, from Bob Snyder, how do satellites and meteors affect the data? Oh, yeah. I think we're a little bit lucky. Spectroscopically, they're not as bad as they are for images mm. because uh, satellites mostly just reflect sunlight. Um, so it gives a nice solar spectrum, which is pretty easy to remove. But um, meteors, actually, the the virus spectrograph is one of the few instruments in the world that has taken spectra of meteors. I mean, Ooh, you can imagine how hard yeah. it would be to take a spectrum of a meteor, right? Because you don't ever know where it's going to come. Yeah. But virus is so big, and it's used so much that we've actually captured spectra of a few meteors. It's extremely rare um, for that to happen. Uh, but there's actually a group working on a research project to study the spectra of meteors because I mean there's like a handful of them in the literature because you just you can't anticipate where to point you just have to get lucky <laughs> so I would say it affects things positively the meteors <laughs> actually um, but no that's a good question um, all right seems most people are choosing three choosing for this three, one yeah, yeah. so yeah high priority it has a relatively loose image quality constraint but I'm, I'm on board that's a that's a pretty good idea so let's see what happens 10 minutes later Sky is even clearer. Things are stable, kind of good. But you know, as you noticed, it was seventy percent to start with. Now it's eighty percent, so we're still not at that ninety percent level or the one point five. That's real strict. So that's kind of a tough one. But okay, cool, cool. Let's go ten more minutes. Um, so the image quality has gotten a little worse. Sometimes after clouds leave and it clears up, the image quality gets kind of turbulent again because uh, we don't have that nice insulating blanket of clouds and the hot air can rise a lot faster. So um, so that's kind of two, 2.1 arc seconds, not very good, but nice clear sky. Uh, and let's go 30 more minutes. OK, so it's still clear, but yeah, 2.5 arc seconds now. The image quality is really blowing up, um, but it's a very clear sky. So OK, we'll stop there because we didn't do the 60 minute target because that would have been bad image quality. So how did you do? Uh, so the, yeah, a lot of people pick number three, and I would say that's correct. And you got a successful observation of the highest priority target at that time. So um, that's great. That's what that's what we want to do. The priority two target was very strict in its requirements, and we just could not meet those with the current sky conditions. So that wasn't a good one to try. Um, and the first one would have been possible to observe. The conditions were acceptable, but it wasn't the highest priority target. So we try to obey the prioritization um, in order to get the best targets we can. So um, three was the right choice. One was kind of the, eh, we'll have a talk about it tomorrow. Why'd you choose that? Um, and two was, two was right out. So, um, yeah, a lot of people got it right. Um, one more. 
Uh, yeah, I think we could do a little, like, uh, yeah, the one final round, okay. and then we'll take some questions. All right. Okay, so last time, you, you all have got the hang of it by now, I'm sure. It's a little later in the night, still coming up close to sunrise. You can start to see the sunlight in the east. Uh, it's still kind of two arcs second inch quality, kind of turbulent, and there's some patchy clouds up there. Uh, so what do you do? We've got a supernova target that's priority zero. It needs two arc seconds. Um, a planet, Barnard Star, has some planets around it, priority one, uh, or a Kepler target that also has some planets around it um, at priority three. Uh, this Kepler target is actually just like the ones we were doing earlier in the night. That's to characterize the exoplanet uh, atmosphere. So, uh, OK, which one do you do? Take a look uh, and decide based on the sky conditions here. Yeah. Well, they're guessing a question that came in from Salil SK. How do you know the spectrum is from the light from the target and not from stuff in between the star and us? How do you filter out the noise? Oh, yeah. It is. It's from everything you get. You get light from everything between that detector and the star. So, um, uh, but we we have lots of different calibrations that remove those effects. So, I guess working in order to the atmosphere, it's pretty much the same all night. It can vary a little bit, um, but we have some um, we have some special standard stars that we take um, that have really smooth spectra. They don't have a lot of absorption lines in them. So they're nice, flat, standard stars. And we observe those, like most nights. And then whatever lines are missing, that's all atmospheric. So that's some of the atmospheric okay. absorption. Then if you remember, we'll look at the HPF data again, but there were those other little bright blips on there. Mm -hmm. um, for that instrument, we have a special fiber that's not pointed at a star. So we have our main fiber on a star. But then we've got this other one just kind of off next to it. Um, and that lets us measure the sky. And so we can subtract the light that comes in from the sky from the light that comes in from the star plus the sky. And with uh -huh. basic arithmetic, you just get the star. So we can remove it that way. And then internally, in, inside the dome, you know, the mirror has some characteristic reflection patterns. And we, we calibrate all of that out with, with internal calibrations. So um, it's, there's a lot of steps, um, because they're right that everything between us and the star matters. <laughs> it can <laughs> absorb or emit light along the way. Um, so we have to remove all of those effects. Good question. All right. All right. Seems uh, some have to mold majority for one, but some for three. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think yeah. So you're you're drawn to this high priority, right? Priority zero. You know that means pretty important. But but we'll see what happens here. Okay. So ten minutes in, image quality has gotten a bit worse. It's getting a little bit of patchy clouds from the west. So these guys are kind of in trouble. 2.3, 20 minutes in, image quality is a little worse, kind of patchy, hanging in there close. 30 minutes later, image quality 2.1, uh, transparency 80%. Ooh. OK, so let's look overall for those 30 minutes. The average sky conditions are about 2.2 arc seconds, image quality pretty turbulent, 75% um, transparency. So uh, that technically is outside the range that that supernova wanted, but this is where the robots would, would fail, because we know that's a supernova. Like, they may have called us that night and said, please observe this. And so they requested two arc second image quality, but they really want that tonight. So <laughs> if you chose the first one, you would make the supernova researchers very happy, because that, that gives them their data. By, by a few days later, the supernova may have faded. So that's a kind of limited opportunity to get the spectrum. Um, the second one, yeah, we, we were nowhere near the image quality required, and it wasn't the highest priority. And the yeah, third one was fine. It was just low priority. It would have been acceptable conditions, uh, just just not the highest priority target. So it's always this balance. And this this is a very simple uh, example, because there's also the like cascading effects in the schedule. Like if you pick an hour-long target at priority two, and there's like a supernova coming up later on in that hour, oh. well, you really shouldn't do that. So sometimes you have to kind of fill in with some small ones to leave space for the big ones. And so it's a there's some, some balancing to think about um, going in there. But I was thinking um, we could share the HPF spectrum again, because yeah. it's been about um, 15 or 20 minutes. Let me stop this yeah. for a second. Yeah, so while uh, like it's pulled up, feel free to submit some questions in the yeah. chat if you haven't already. There have been some, and actually, yes, you're pulling in the HPF. Actually, a question came in about the nebula spectrum that mm -hmm. we saw earlier. Yeah. 
from Quantum Radio, cool high resolution spectra. <laughs> I still don't get what the black and white image with the white strations is oh, yeah. all about. Yeah. I get the white strations are spectra, but why multiple vertical stray strations? Yes. Yeah. No, it's it's good. It takes a while to really get those images. Um, so let me pull up. Um, let me pull up that one first. Just give me one second here. We can look at that planetary nebula again and answer that, I hope. 16. Okay. I'm going to share the screen. Spectre over here. Okay. So, what we're looking at is complicated. Uh, so the, um, what was this? Oh, for quantum radio, yeah. yeah. So here it is. Yeah. Why multiple vertical? Yeah, 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 okay. So, right, so the horizontal are the separate fibers, you know, where this is the blue end and that's the red end. So um, I guess I would turn the question right back around to you. What does it mean if there's kind of a vertical feature? That's the same color in every single fiber. So something is emitting light at exactly that color, and that something is in every fiber we have on the sky right now. So um, what's the only thing that's in every uh, fiber? star? No, the stars would be small. The fibers are huge and cover lots of space. Oh, so it would just be the night sky the in general? Sky? Exactly, yeah. So that's, that's, um, that's what the spectrum of the night sky looks like. Uh, there's lots of different components of sky emission. People don't think about like <laughs> what what lights up the night sky, um, but but there's different um, different layers of our atmosphere. There's different gases and different chemicals, and as the sun's radiation affects them and magnetic fields affect them, they glow or not at different amounts. And a lot of that emission is is just single wavelengths coming out. So I I'm, I should know it, but I don't remember which which light that one is from. But but it's it's always there. It's there every night, every spectrum. That's the night sky. So, uh, and you know that because it's in every single fiber. <laughs> so, uh, that's what we we can uh, subtract out. Yeah, I think they're also kind of asking about kind of like the little lines to the side, like the ones that's like kind of thick, but then there's like those that yeah. appear in just some fibers but not others. Exactly. So that's that's the what I would say is the interesting stuff. If they're in only some fibers, that means that's our target. So there's some blank fibers around the edges, just looking at the sky. And then these ones actually are are the target. Oh, so that's the planetary nebula. Okay. And then these are just blank sky. Uh, so the yeah, planetary nebula's got H alpha and sulfur, uh, and then the sky is in every single one. Sky, 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 sky. sky. Okay. <laughs> Whereas, yeah, the planetary nebula is kind of small, just in one little spot. So, but these uh, once you've looked at them for several years, they're very friendly and familiar. Um, but at, at the beginning, they're not. So I actually I prepared one example of this data. Let me see if I can drag that over here. So what we do um, after we observe these, and they get sent back to Austin to the supercomputer every morning, um, they get processed. And so we don't send the astronomers these kind of stripy images, because honestly, they wouldn't know what to do with them. <laughs> um, we've got a bunch of software packages that, that process that. And so what they produce is something like this collapsed image. So. This is the result of a lot of processing, um, where we've taken we've taken some software that extracts the light from every fiber separately, every one of those horizontal stripes, and then it knows where that fiber was on the sky, and it reconstructs this image ah. of the sky. And as you mouse over, as you mouse your cursor over this image, every little pixel is showing you at the bottom there what that spectrum is. So this is this is what we observe. This is the data product that we make. It's, it's called a data cube. So it's like an image, but instead of just measuring how bright each pixel is, we measure the full rainbow spectrum of each pixel. And that's what you can see by mousing around. So this is um, this is a galaxy we observed uh, several months ago that I pulled up as an example, because it's from one of my research projects. So I'm allowed to show it, and I don't have to <laughs> check with anybody. Um, so this is this is the galaxy. It's kind of a, a dwarf galaxy relatively nearby. But it's got this clump in its outskirts. And you can see, if I put the cursor over here, those squiggles are just the sky emission lines. They're kind of messy in there. But if I put my cursor right over this, you see those a few of those really bright lines show up. Lock that, and this here 
is that same hydrogen alpha that we were just oh. talking about in the planetary nebulas. This is a star-forming galaxy. It also has hydrogen gas in it. And that's that little sulfur pair off to the side of it. A very similar object to this where you've got hydrogen alpha and sulfur. Uh, here, hydrogen alpha and sulfur. Oh, so cool. um, every pixel is a spectrum. That's the amazing power of, of this kind of an observation. Um, so it's, um, it's a very rich data set. Um, I wanted to show that HPF spectrum too. Oh, yeah. Here. Lost that, okay. So this is what it looks like after, after about 30 minutes, or 15 minutes. This is a 15 minute exposure here. Um, and so I'll zoom in on a nice spot. You can see. Yeah, so you can see this bright stripe is the is the light from the star, and there's one of those absorption lines, a little dark feature in there, and that's what we would watch shift back and forth over the course of many weeks. Um, and then these bright blips are um, emission lines from the night sky. And what you're seeing here is that is the two fibers that we have. So yeah. This is the fiber that we put right on the star, and we see the starlight and the sky. And this is the fiber that we put on the sky, so we see only the sky. So what our software can do is measure the light from the sky and then subtract that, you know, just remove those little blips from down here so that we get just the star. Oh, so okay. it's, a, it's a really fantastic technique to, to remove the effect of the sky lines. Okay. So that's, anyway, yeah, that's our latest and greatest um, Exoplanet for the night. So yeah. We'll be doing it all night. When the moon is out, we use the um, infrared spectrograph for most of the night. So a lot of our targets will be uh, exoplanets tonight. So, yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah, so we're kind of rolling, rolling low on time, but there is one final question that I think will be fun to answer sure. from Jeff Hart. Was in the bottles up in the wall by the clock? Because <laughs> you noticed. Uh, well, they're all empty now, I can say. Um, so th those were um, celebrations for various uh, accomplishments of the telescope. So when we built a new instrument or when we um, commissioned a new part of the telescope to work for the first time, um, those were those were put up there. Uh, this telescope was originally built in the 90s. We, we didn't talk much tonight about the history and the technology. There's, there's actually a live stream from a couple of weeks ago yeah. that folks can refer back to if they want to really um, fantastic in-depth view of, of the telescope, but um, it was built in the 90s and then about 10 years ago we shut it down um, for a couple of years to do a really major upgrade. Um, and that upgrade involved building new instruments and expanding the tracker and, and expanding the wide field corrector and just really overhauling the system. It's an amazing um, step uh, forward for the telescope. Uh, and there were lots of achievements along the way, and so all the <laughs> bottles are are for various achievements. Because we're scientists, they're all labeled. Someone has a label maker, and they're dated exactly what the reason for the celebration was, and it's it's very organized. Um, and I don't know if you can tell on the camera, but one of them is a little bit shorter than the rest because it was opened with oh, a yeah. saber. Oh, that's why that one's shorter. Oh yeah, that. it's like the fourth one from yeah. from the from the clock. Right, chopped off with the the sword, so I wasn't oh, here cool. for that, but I just think it was very exciting. So, um, so we do celebrate, we do have some fun up here as well, but um, it's a lot, of, a lot of fun to make an amazing telescope like this work, so we celebrate. Well, I think that's about all the time we have. Thank you so much for, you know, yeah. talking with us, showing the data, and letting us get a view of the control room. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us and coming to see what very few people have ever seen before. Yeah, so, no, um, very few people sure. can see this, so... Have again. Let's see what Dr. Stephen Janowicki said there. Give more details about like, some of the engineering and some of the history, and kind of a little bit more stuff with some of the other some of the other aspects of the research. A couple of weeks ago, we did do a stream for the HET's birthday. It's still here on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you all for joining tonight. And yeah, again, thank you for joining in, participating in the games and the questions. And we really hope y'all enjoyed. Yeah, and y'all have a, a good night.